Well, regardless of where you are in the world for where I'm at, this would be a good morning. And we'd like to welcome you to our first BGS Advantage webinar series session. My name is Katie Avendano. I'm the Senior Manager of Collegiate Chapter Operations here at Beta Gamma Sigma. On behalf of our team at BGS, we are delighted to have you joining us here today. Before we get started, I do want to call attention to the question and answer section within this webinar. You should be able to notice this at the bottom of your screen. This is an interactive session, so we will open the floor for questions later on in the presentation. Today, our session is focused on navigating the career landscape. Your speakers today are Jody Weiss and Brendan Gallagher from Corn Ferry. Both Jody and Brendan have been engaged with Beta Gamma Sigma in the past, and most recently were presenters and speakers at the 2019 BGS Global Leadership Summit. We are so excited to have both Jody and Brendan here today. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it on over to them to get the session started. Great. Great. I'm just going to share my um, screen. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I'm having a, a moment of a technical difficulty here. Hold on one second. Let me share our screen. Okay. Okay, so does everyone see the PowerPoint? Yes, you are good. Okay, wonderful. So really great to meet you all. Um, I'm Jody Weiss. I lead the nonprofit and education practice at Corn Ferry. Corn Ferry is a global professional services firm with a strong focus on executive search, um, which means that we are the ones working behind the scenes to hire CEOs, executive directors, um, board roles across all industries and across all functions. And we also provide advisory services, everything from executive coaching to um, diversity, equity, and inclusion training. Like most people at Corn Ferry, this is my second career or third career. Um, I was in publishing for over a decade and I was also an English professor for over 15 years. And I mentioned that as later in the discussion, we're going to speak a bit about range versus specialist. Um, I'm excited to be with all, with all of you today to discuss the career landscape. As you can see, and I'm gonna turn our slides, we have lots to cover today and I'm going to turn it over to Brendan, my colleague to say hello. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, I've been with Corn Ferry for about six years. I've been lucky enough to be in the same nonprofit and education practice for that amount of time. Uh, we specifically have the opportunity to work with universities and nonprofit organizations on the leadership appointments across uh, a number of functions. Uh, prior to the search world, I spent 10 years in higher education, um, close to a decade at the University of Pennsylvania. The second part of my time there was working with MBA students on career development, industry placement, specifically within the investment management vertical. And for the first half of my time there, uh, I started athletics and coaching and working with student athletes. Um, Jody and I really uh, enjoy this conversation that we've had in the past with all of you, and we're really looking forward to discussing more today. So thank you. Okay, great. So we're going to jump right in and get started. As you see, we have a lot to cover. Um, and before we delve into the discussion, there's a few statistics that are worth noting regarding the college to career gap. And so 24% of employers do not feel that academic institutions are adequately preparing students for roles within their organizations. 47% of employers said too much emphasis is put on book learning versus real world learning. And 25% of college grads work in a field that relates to their degree. All of which is to say that it's not just about what you do in the classroom that's going to help you to prepare for your career. Internships and any experiential learning opportunities that you can take part in are absolutely going to help you. And beyond that, it's really often about the soft skills you gain in college. Collaboration, teamwork, critical thinking, and they're all very valuable. We're gonna talk a lot more about that later in our discussion today. And also when it comes to finding the secret to success, it's not where you go, it's how you do it that makes all the difference in higher education. So it's really worth noting that whether you go to Harvard or State University, it's more about what you put into school. It's more about sometimes those extracurricular activities. Are you involved in committees, volunteer work? Um, how close are you with your professors, athletics? 
What are your mentor relationships? So the goal is to really make the most of your college career or your graduate school career for that matter. Okay. So we are gonna move right into career story. Um, if you've ever heard the terminology elevator speech, your career story is not at all dissimilar. So it's an opportunity for you to synthesize your passion and purpose into a succinct statement that shows who you are, what you're about, what you aspire to. It's basically the answer to the question, why should I hire you? And every chapter of your career, whether you're first year or you're 15 years into your career, every chapter, every job change, career change merits a new career story. And so what does your career story include? It's your accomplishments to date. It's everything from academics to your full-time job experience, your internships, your community work. It might include how you, you know, what you might've changed or adapted in your life during the pandemic. Um, practice it once you have that career story down pat. Your goal is to truly be authentic and clear. The worst thing that you can do when you're speaking at an interview is to become somebody that you're not. And so you can shoot videos of yourself, you can practice with friends um, over FaceTime, over Zoom. And you know, the goal is you wanna bring who you are to work and to these interviews because that's who ends up showing up in the long run. Um, so, so it's important that authenticity is something that employers are really looking for. So anything you'd wanna add on that, Brendan? Yeah, we try to gauge authenticity all day, whether it's for a CEO position, whether it's somebody you know earlier in their career. Um, that's evident right up front. No matter the, the the job you're looking for, the functional expertise that you have, the skill sets that you have, the authenticity about who you are is going to play out over the long range. So um, it's evident at, at any position at any level. So we really want to um, you know, really kind of drill that in early for there for, with everyone. Okay, great. Okay. So we're gonna move on to resumes and resumes are truly your first impression with LinkedIn profiles being your second impression. And you know we cannot stress enough, um, LinkedIn is the minute somebody gets your resume, they're typically going to your LinkedIn profile. So you know that's something maybe when we have a bit of a Q and A, we can talk a lot of, little bit more. Um, and you know I should say, save all of your questions. We're going to leave as much space as we can to answer them. So any topic we're talking about, career stories, resumes, and everything ahead, um, please jot down questions because we want to hear from them. We will, we want to hear them and we will answer them. Um, so, so here's our advice for resumes. And Brendan and myself, gosh, we look at probably hundreds of resumes a week. And the best thing we can say is unless you're an artist, unless you're a designer, um, a classic resume is always the best direction skip the creative versions. You don't wanna get shut out from a job opportunity because your resume was too busy and it was confusing to the person looking at it. So resume should always be easy to read. You know, you can hold it up, make sure you can see it. Everything's concise, clear. Um, they should tell a story. So if, there's, if you're looking at your resume and you just seem to see one experience after the other and there's no connection, try to think about how you can connect it how you can put the resumes together so that there's a story, that it makes sense why you went from one job to the next job, you know, so, and you can put that story into your summary statement. Um, you want to list your accomplishments. So it's not so much what you're doing every day. It's not the job description. It's much more about your accomplishments. What impact have you made in the, the role that you're doing? You want to tell the truth. Don't embellish your resume. Um, we've seen too many people at the last minute, um, endless interviews, there was a lie on their resume. And we found it out whether it was a false degree information. I mean, we could go on and on about that, but tell the truth um, and avoid cliches. So while you might be the most dramatic, driven, self-motivated, you know, on and on person, um, let the interviewers know that about you, show that in your cover letter, write something, you know, be that wow. There's other ways to do it than on your resume. Your resume should really be accurate. It should be again, authentic um, without those cliches. Okay, um, so, so here's the resume basics. And, you know, it, it's, it's super basic, right? You've seen this before. If you've worked with your career office, I'm sure this is nothing new. At the top, you include your name, you include your email, your phone number, LinkedIn URL. If there's a website that you want people to go to, you know, if you keep a blog, that's fine. There's no reason to put your address anymore. We, we rarely see that. 
Um, you can put your city of state. If you want to note that you're willing to relocate, that's fine too. Um, that summary statement, again, that's how you, you pull everything on your resume together. If it's all disjointed because you're going to be a pre-med major and then you decided you were going into business, so you have lots of hospital experience, tie it together with the summary statement. Um, you, you know, it's really valuable. That summary statement, think of it as a roadmap. Um, it does not have to be more than two or three sentences, but you are steering the reader along your career path. And so what you seek, what you've excelled at, capture it in those few sentences. Um, later in your career, which you know, we can answer questions about, we don't really see the summary as much. Um, we see it more in the cover letter, but when you're early in your career, that summary statement's incredibly helpful. Um, if you're a recent graduate, undergrad or grad, put your education experience at the top. Um, and then your professional experience and everything counts. Internships, your full-time job experience, um, volunteer work, right? Get it all in there. If you've worked, if, if you financed your degrees um, working at a store, put it on there because that's customer service and that's incredibly valuable for any industry that you go into. Um, do not put a list of your interests, right? So you might love writing courses and cooking and it's just, it's not that it's not important. It's not necessarily the right place. Um, the great place to get to those details and, and important nuances about yourself are conversations during interviews. Um, you know, one other thing I'll say is during interviews, you will often get asked, you know, what do you do for fun? And that's the opportunity to share all of those interests. You might also get asked, what's the last book you read? And so, you know, save it for conversation as opposed to stacking your resume. Um, you probably do want to put, if you've been on sports, um, you know, lead teams and so forth, that's fine to put on your resume. So anything, Brendan, that you want to add to that? Yeah, there's a, there's a fine balance between telling the story, kind of setting the stage, not putting a life story on there. Um, everything is really reading it through the eyes of the prospective employer and who you're going to be speaking with. So while you have high line of achievements and stories you want to tell, the resume really should be succinct and, and set the stage for a lot of that conversation. Start the cell, we'll go into more kind of preferred verbiage with action, action words and action um, terms to use. Uh, but really, I mean, if you, if you, unless you're an academic with years of publications, a five page resume is probably gonna be glossed over. It, it really is the succinctness of it and it's how you can encapsulate your story in an, in an engaging way, but also a brief way. Okay, great. So resume do's and don'ts. And I mean, we could go on and on, right? But, but we just cover the basics. Um, you know, and, and something worth mentioning because the pandemic has changed our work environment so dramatically that you, know, you might wanna add on your resume um, your ability to pivot. So if you went from in-person education to taking classes at home, or if your work became virtual or your internship became virtual, you can absolutely find a creative way to put that in your resume. Um, you might wanna illustrate your adaptability, which is just critical for every career, meaning that you're running conferences via webinar versus in person, um, you know, volunteer work you've done and so forth. You know, how have you adapted? How has the 2020, um, made some difference in some way. So you can put that on your resume, it's timely, right? It might not belong there in a year or two. Um, so you do wanna use keywords. You know, we, we get asked so much about this. Um, there's, every industry has different keywords. It's fine to use them, um, but it's also good to shine and add some different things. I know some organizations are just going by keywords. So by all means use them you know, keep the format simple. So don't overcomplicate your resume. Um, some resumes we look at have so much going on. They have icons, they have columns, they have side panels. They look beautiful. They look like works of art, but I can't, I don't know where I'm supposed to look. And, you know, when you're looking at endless resumes every day, people get frustrated really quickly. So simple is always best. Um, you know, a, a lot of this information on the do's is pretty basic. I would say, you know, one of the keys to point out is do you use data, put metrics into your resume. So when it comes to your accomplishments, get specific. If you've improved supply chain costs by 50%, put that in there. If you've cut department costs, 
if you grew revenue, if you helped hire five people and that made a substantial impact on an organization, put that in there. Get really specific because it tends to be what employers are going to narrow in on, you know, the positive impacts, the cost effectiveness that you brought to an internship, a, you know, your, a job, whatever you're doing. Um, and again, it is okay to put you know, full time, uh, I'm sorry, it is okay to put volunteer or non work related experience on there as well. Um, and it could be incredibly helpful too. Um, in terms of the don't, so all too often we see people adapt their resume to exactly mirror a job description. It's just too coincidental that you suddenly have all, you know, every bit of experience that a job is looking for. And so what I would say is, um, you know, don't do that, right? It's not something that's that's going to really help you. And don't overuse acronyms. While something might be, you know, easy for you and you might understand this for, you know, the acronyms make sense, somebody else looking at it might not know what those acronyms stand for. Um, the other thing, don't put anything confidential. Don't include salary data. Don't include any confidential company information. If you're launching something new, you don't want to put that on your resume. You know, you can save that for a conversation. Um, don't include obvious skills. Everybody knows Microsoft by this, you know, you know, there's things that we all have pretty much down pat. Everybody knows you know how to type and so forth. No need to put that on a resume. Um, don't include random off-putting hobbies. And I only mention this because we've seen everything from, you know, riding horses and drinking wine and, um, you know, really endless captivating uh, aspects of a person's life. They sound great, but they're really not relevant. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind and don't go overboard. Um, we know references are available upon request. And, you know, Brendan was just saying succinct is critical, but you don't have to squish it all in. So it absolutely does not all have to happen in one page. You can have a resume that's two or three pages if it makes sense to, right? Like don't put fluff in, but you can add more information. Sometimes we see a resume so condensed and it doesn't make sense and it's not necessary to have it all in one page. So think about that. Um, and then the rest of it, I think is pretty self-explanatory, but Brendan, anything you would add to this? Yeah, it's all about really taking a, a little bit of extra time in curating your resume for positions does go the extra mile. A lot of times coming out of undergraduate, coming out of graduate programs, your blanket applying to a lot of places, which is fine, but taking the time to ensure that the information is right, both cover letters, um, if there's tweaks that need to be made for a specific position to the resume, not leaving in past com company information or other application materials, it's likely a needless to say, but really being mindful about each version you are producing um, for the specific position, just curate it. It takes the extra few minutes, but it really will go the mile because your, your skill sets, your experiences could perfectly, perfectly align with the position, but if there's something left over from another role or another application, it's an immediate you know, uh, disqualifier for a lot of people. So just taking that extra time, having, some, have a, having a peer take a look at uh, a copy of a resume or a letter um, is equally as important too. So um, those extra few steps are really, um, really pretty, pretty key in, in your overall process, which can seem intimidating overall, but um, it's really just taking a very curated approach to each opportunity that you're looking at. So we actually do have a couple of questions related to resumes. So if you guys don't mind, I'm gonna go ahead and ask those since we're on the topic. Sure. Um, so one question was asked is, do you recommend um, ha having someone be a resume writer for you? And if so, do you have any recommendations of a company or how someone would go about that? Sure, I'll start. Um, as somebody who's written a lot of resumes for executives, um, because sometimes we they're not looking for a job and, and we're trying to move quickly, so we'll help them. Um, I think that you do have to write your own resume. And meaning that no one knows what you're doing better than you. And so when you hand that over to somebody else, you're giving them the responsibility to, you know, guesstimate um, details about your background and they fill in the blanks and they're using a lot of catchphrases and so forth. And so, um, you know, I think that, yes, it could be painful. It's not everybody's expertise, but I do think writing your own is great. If you really need somebody to help you, um, I think Corn Ferry Advance, like, part, you know, we have uh, experts at our company that help you, but they help you more with a template than actually writing out all the details. 
Brendan, anything you'd add about that? Yeah, I'd say getting getting the help. Uh, a lot of times it can be intimidating starting um, if you don't have anything. I think that the template support can help. But to Jody's point, it's about personalizing your own experience. Only you know um, as far as the the terminology, the workplaces that you've been within, the specific skill sets. So use someone as a sounding board, uh, as a colleague, as a peer um, to help bounce ideas. But really, crafting your own at the end of the day um, is most advisable because then you can speak to it. If, the, if there's you know, when you're in front of uh, an interview, when you're, you know, make it to the next rounds of interfacing with employers, if it's not as familiar with you on your own resume, it's going to be really tough to help reinforce a lot of that. So the more familiarity and kind of firsthand experience you can have with it, the better. Brendan, you did make a note about having somebody review a resume. So a question we were asked is, do you think it's best for um, a candidate to have maybe a connection at another company review a resume or maybe working with a mentor directly as somebody to review or maybe a combination of both? I think you're sure it's a great question. It depends on, on, on the setting that you're in. Certainly career offices, um, professors, uh, alumni that, that might be in more of an informal capacity could really be a, a great support system in that. Um, if you have a contact at the company, again, not an official capacity, but um, if there's, and we'll talk about this with networking, but if there's a contact that you, ha you can have to get some informal feedback, that's certainly advisable as well. And then another question we had is, what, what are your recommendations for those that maybe have a career gap? So we've kind of had two different examples. One of them involved um, taking some time away from working to go back and get education um, to expand. Another one maybe is a career gap due to graduating. And now with the pandemic, unfortunately, a lot of companies are hiring internally, making it harder for somebody. So how would you recommend noting that um, on a resume while still trying to highlight the achievements that the person has been able to go through? Yeah, I can offer something. I recently saw somebody put gardening break, and I just thought that was, uh, you know, really interesting. Um, and it was someone from the UK, and and you know, he said, "No, this is what we all we all put down." So, so there are no gaps, right? So what are you doing in that time? Um, and it could be anything from mentoring, volunteering. Um, you, you know, so I would think about how you're using the time, and you can even write something creative. During the pandemic, I've spent this time. Um, taking online certification classes or studying more about XYZ or volunteering at the local food bank. So, you know, because I, I don't think people are just sitting around waiting for the next job. So I would think about and be creative, like what you are doing and how you're using that time to, you know, better yourself um, and, and put something like that. I do think it's okay to acknowledge it because every single person who looks at a resume, the first two comments that usually come up are, wow, they were only here for six months or a year, or what did they do between these two years? And so I think sometimes addressing it, it does not always have to be on a resume. It can be in a cover letter too. You can put it on your LinkedIn profile. Um, you can write in a cover letter, but I would, it, it's a great way to be creative. It's exactly right. And it's a much different conversation today than it was a year ago. We are in a wholly different world and career gaps or holes on resumes mean different things now. Uh, and it's a global understood about, um, about gaps in hiring and layoffs and you know just these unexpected times in people's professional and personal lives. So omitting it and just having a, a, a date gap on a resume is going to call question to it. Um, a lot of times we'll see just omissions of dates on resumes from more senior leaders and we'll have to address it with them and a lot of times it's justified. Um, but putting something in just as far as professional development, um, how you align during that time um, is a great conversation starter and, and again sort of eliminates any areas of question on a resume. But um, it's just a lot more understood and accepted in this time. Um, but it is about framing it um, the right way on a resume or in a cover letter. I'm going to add one more thing. I've also seen a number of resumes, people caring for elderly parents or, you know, um, family members. And um, in a world where, you know, we're striving to be more empathetic and compassionate, um, I think it's okay to put those nuances in. And, and I think it actually um, makes people appear more human. Uh, you know, like when somebody's looking at that resume, they're going to pause for a moment if they see something like that. Wonderful. Well, those are the questions that we had related to resume. We do have a couple of other ones, but I think they'll be better suited later on. So we'll go ahead and ask those at that time. 
Okay, great. So um, we are going to move on to networking, which is, um, you know, you hear so much about networking, but but it's I, I just can't stress how important networking actually is. And it falls under a number of categories. And so you've got your formal network, which might be the people you work with, your supervisors, your professors, you have your informal network, um, friends, colleagues, your schoolmates. You've got online network, which is people you may not know them at all. You interact with them on LinkedIn or other social networks. And then you have people you meet offline. So maybe it's someone you meet in an event like this, um, You know, somebody you might've taken a class with and, and you know, you're just, don't have that much um, you know, knowledge of one another, but they're still part of your network. And it, I can't stress how much it matters. And um, Brenda and I were talking about this, you know, your weak ties. The weak ties are, for instance, your parents' friends that you might see you know, once every two, three months or so. Or it could be you know, that somebody in your life that, that you don't know that very well um, may be the person who introduces you to someone who hires you for your next job. So weak ties are really critical in your career route. They have a whole realm of possibilities. And usually your weak ties know all these people that you would never interact with um, if it was not for that weak tie. So I mention it because you don't, you know, everyone counts. Everybody you interact with might be looking for somebody who has the skill sets that you have. And so it's, it's really empowering to put yourself out there a little bit. Um, networking is not going away. So it's critical from your first job to your, you know, 15 years later into your career, um, you know, much of our business at Quinn Ferry is based on networking. So we are constantly reaching out to people who have just been superstars in their career and we call them and we're asking them if they're interested. And if they're not, we're asking them who we should know, who they know, who they might be able to introduce us to. And I would say, gosh, you know, a tremendous percentage of the people we hire come from that networking. Um, every week I receive many introductions. People tell me you need to know each other. Um, sometimes one phone call, one conversation turns into their replacement six months later. There's somebody that we actually um, hire for a, a big role. And so get comfortable with it. And you know, LinkedIn and other social networks make it so much easier, so much more accessible right now. You don't need to wait to go to these in-person events. Um, so, so make use of it. And the other thing I'll say, um, a great networking tool, um, and I don't see everyone taking advantage of it, is becoming a thought leader. Because if you know something about your industry, and it might be about being a student, and it might be about how difficult the job market is to break into right now during the pandemic, you know, coming out of college, coming out of grad school, write an article about it. You know, it's it's insane. It's unbelievable when you put something out on LinkedIn that resonates, um, the following that you can get from it, how many people will reach out to you because of that. Um, you know, if you can be on panels, if you can, you know, anything that you're an expert about, try to get yourself out there, get your name out there in the most simple way that you can. And the other thing is, um, I don't know, you know, when, when I was in school and, and after grad school and so forth, I used to write letters to anyone that I just thought was incredible and inspired me. And mostly it was authors. I would write to them and they'd always write back. And so, and with LinkedIn and Twitter and Instagram, it's just so much easier right now. Reach out to people who inspire you. Um, I respond to as many uh, LinkedIn notes as I possibly can. I know Brendan does, um, but but that's all part of networking, and that's all part of creating these relationships. And I'm going to pause, and and um, you know, Brendan, please please add to it. Sure. So networking, you know, it's something you hear as an undergrad. It's something you hear if you're in a graduate program. And personally, I never exactly knew what the application of it was. It's it's. It's recommended as, as one of the top things to be aware of, to be you know, familiarized with, but what does it actually mean? And to Jody's point, you know, there, there, no other industry is it more reinforced about what networking is than executive search. And it's just really been crystallized for me. You know, it's about the relationships with people. It's about um, treating people, you know, sort of in, a, in, a, in both in, a, in an immediate and long-term um, relationship kind of way, meaning, our entire industry is based on people we know, how we can leverage expertise, how we can provide opportunities. And a lot of the people we work with on the client side come back to us 
Um, and in the executive search world, a lot of that business is repeat because of the networks that you have. And it's really, I mean, I love this industry because it's one of the last bastions of, you know, sort of communication and relationships and how do you really um, bring people into the fold. And, you know, the other part about where you are now sort of in the job search process is it's all about the positioning and your outreach to those in your network, to people outside of your network, shouldn't just be in the sense or the delivery of, I'm looking for an internship or I'm looking for a, comp a, a job at your company. It's here's what I can bring. Here's my value differentiator. Heck, here's how things are a little bit different. I'd love to just connect to learn more about your path. It's really, you know, putting yourself out there to learn more, not just a resume submission, um, because people are, are less apt to respond if it's just that, you know, sort of um, quantitative -y kind of approach to networking. It's about learning more about their pathway. Alumni are always willing to engage. And I think one of the key differentiators also is reaching out to alums from your, from your collegiate address. A lot of times there's a lot of volume for email for everyone today. Um, there's noise from every angle. A lot of times if an alum sees someone reach out with that college handle or university handle in their email, they're just more apt to respond. So it's just setting up time to speak and kind of laying the foundation, laying that initial relationship building without the expectation or promise that they're going to get a job for you. So that builds, that network just organically grows. Even if that person can't immediately help you, they might introduce you to two people and your network is just doubled in a morning. So it's really about that, um, again, sort of that organic soft approach to information gathering and differentiating who you are and why your resume might be different and what your skill set might be bring differently. And, and I think that really resonates with the job search process too. A lot of times if we get you know, a submission from someone, it's I wanna be ex director at this place. But if they are a little bit more resonant as far as like why that mission matters to them and how their alignment might pair with this organization, we're going to go with that person, just at least for an initial conversation. That opens the door and it's a lot, Again, it's just a little bit softer of an approach. It's nuanced, um, but it's about setting, um, it's just setting the stage for conversation without, without the promise or expectation that something's going to happen for you. You know, Brendan, you said something, it's just so important. Um, the tone you use is critical because when you, you know, we get these emails at just five paragraphs of why they need to be hired for a job. And then we get somebody who's a gentle approach who says, this looks incredible. I wanna learn more. I'd love to talk to you about it. We're going to usually call that person um, who wants to learn more about it, as opposed to the person who's just gushing about themselves and why they are the right person. So think about your tone. It does not always have to be so formal. And you know, I think for some people that's a hard realization. You don't have to write these very formal, stiff notes if you're reaching out to somebody for the first time by email or on LinkedIn. You can get to be yourself a little bit, and you can you know, say something like, I'm, I'm intrigued by your job. I'd love to understand more about it. You know, who doesn't want to talk about themselves? So um, you're more likely to engage that person. But think about, you know, it doesn't have to be so formal. Think about your tone when you're interacting with someone. And, and you know, you might have to experiment a little bit. You might have to see what's right, right? You don't want to be kind of like, um, you know, too much. You don't want to come on too strong. But I would find that blend between being formal and being a little bit more casual and authentic again, right? So that word always is going to keep coming back up. Okay, so now we're going to move on to interviewing, which is, you know, interviewing is really an art. And um, Brendan and myself, the whole team, gosh, we sit in on dozens of interviews a week. And um, it's, it's truly when it's done well, it's an art. And the interviewer has an incredible experience and those who are interviewing have a great experience too. There's a true connection. So, you know, if I can implant anything, a great interview means there was a strong connection. Um, and how do you get to that connection? It starts with research. You must do your homework, right? Like treat it like a paper assignment before you're going on an interview. Learn everything you possibly can about a company, about the role, about the people you're interviewing with. Do not go into a meeting blindly, no matter what. Even if you just feel like you don't care and you don't need the job, um, 
do the research, use LinkedIn, use Glassdoor, go to the company websites, read the employee bios, don't interview blindly either. Really press hard to find out who you're actually meeting with so that you can look up that person and read a little bit about them. Um, and you have to know why you want a job. So absolutely have an answer prepared. You cannot wing that, right? So you can't say, well, you called me for an interview or I came. And you can't say, I don't know why I want the job. Um, you know, have an answer prepared. And even if it's not your dream job, make an interview count. It's all experience. It's a great opportunity. And um, you never know if the person who's interviewing you for a job at one company today Two years down the line, you are interviewing for a job you really do want, and it's that same person. Um, because we, everyone remembers. We all remember. <laughs> I remember people we placed in roles 15 years ago. I remember people I met last week. We remember that interaction. It's really the aura of a person that you remember. So make it great. You know, really make it a great experience. Um, you know, in terms of listening. If you feel like you're talking too much, you're absolutely talking too much. And so some of us know that about ourselves. Um, you have to practice. You have to come up for air. It's absolutely okay to provide a short answer, take a pause, ask the interviewer, did I answer your question? Do you want me to keep going, right? So um, don't just ramble on. And, and if you need to look at your watch, whatever you need to do to make sure that you're not rambling on, um, and do it. And I, I just can't stress how many people who are well qualified, wonderful candidates, um, they, they, they mess up an interview because they're just talking too much. And it, it just discombobulates everyone. And, and I'm going to let, um, I'll let Brendan weigh in on that because we've sat through many interviews where people just go on and on. Yeah, we have. It's all, you know, it's all about the preparation, the due diligence phase. Um, arguably has never been easier than it is today. 990 strategic plans, basic website information can be consumed in about a 10 minute period. So, you know, it's not to say you should curate your search to only speak with your top three and, and, and mitigate any other opportunities. You know, if you're going wide, that's fine. But, you know, it, it really is about the preparation. It's about the diligence phase. Um, just looking into um, just an extra layer of information, something that you could really cite um, during the course of conversation, a question that you had as far as their programming that's on their website or something about their, um, you know, pivot during, during the pandemic. Personalizing those questions is really important. And that's what's resonant for, um, for employers when they're, you know, kind of reviewing who they spoke with. There's a lot of parity with a lot of talented people and the ability to really differentiate skill set wide is harder today. You're all talented. You have you know, great academic pedigrees, uh, likely work experience. So it's about how you can resonate a little bit differently in the interview that you're in. So just that extra time up front in the diligence phase, um, there's creative ways to look into um, company information. Um, there's social media accounts, whatever, it, regardless of the industry, regardless of the, the industry vertical that you might be in, um, it really is about being able to talk a little bit of shop with who you're having the conversation with. And to Jody's point, you know, measuring, um, the time that you're you're spent speaking and the time listening, you know, we counsel all of our clients and our and our um, candidates that inform information. Uh, I'm sorry, interviews are are an information sharing session. Um, there's nothing, you know, a lot of times more dry than just an hour of Q and A. Um, you want to personalize it a little bit. You want to have good questions. We we no matter what position we're recruiting for, when we set a candidate and a client up to interview, it's really the same format. Two thirds of it are questions that are prepared and thoughtful from the committee. And the other third are questions that we counsel the candidates specifically to have for the group. It's just a great two way share of information. Um, again, it's a small nuanced thing and not every interview that you're gonna be in might be like that, um, but just the listening, coming prepared with actionable questions um, and playing back some of the things that you learned during the interview as well at the end, I think is a good, um, you know, just sort of takeaway point, again, a potential point of resonance for the interviewers. Okay, great. And, you know, plan, meaning don't leave the interview and, and be vague and not know what's coming next, right? Make sure you have a solid what's coming next. Are they going to follow up with you? What's their time frame? Are they making a decision this month or in three months? You know, you can ask those questions um, and also ask any other questions you have. Usually at the end of the interview, as Brenda noted, um, they leave time for you. So go prepared, be thoughtful, have some great questions prepared. 
And then after the interview, really reflect and um, consider how did you do? What can you improve upon? Um, and you know, also reflect on the company. Is this a place you want to work at? Because all too often you just take a job because it's the job you're getting offered. And, and you know, I understand in some circumstances right now you might think that's the best thing to do, but really reflect on um, what's right for you. Even if you take the job for short term, know what you love about it, what's not ideal for you, and so forth. Okay. Um, you know, a few things we'll just say about virtual interviews. Uh, download the technology beforehand. I you know, cannot stress this enough. Be sure that whether it's Zoom, Google, uh, Microsoft Teams, this happens to us. So it's not just you know, like sometimes we get thrown off by a client as different technology. Make sure that you know what you're using, set it up, test it out with the friend. Um, oftentimes we prep with our candidates. We do a little trial run with our clients. And so you can ask an administrative person before a virtual interview, if they can go through it with you, it's okay. Um, you know, the basics, make sure your lighting is okay. Make sure you're well positioned. Um, I've seen sometimes when people use their cell phone to do a video interview, we see the inside of their ear or other crazy things like know what you're doing. <laughs> make sure you take the time to practice that um, so that you don't have any unpleasant experiences. Um, make sure you're early, right? It's so key. There's nothing like being a few minutes late and it being disheveled and so forth. So that's, you know, really critical. Um, you know, types of interviews, we're, we're rarely seeing any face-to-face. -face. Some of our clients want that, but um, people are COVID testing. I think by the third quarter, we're gonna see a little bit more in-person interviews. Um, you know, sometimes you might be on a panel interview. Sometimes you might have your interview recorded. I've seen sometimes clients, um, you know, they give candidates questions and ask them to record themselves answering it, just go with the flow, right? This is, I think, a strange time for everyone. Um, be comfortable, practice the technology, and so forth. Okay, so the do's and don'ts. Um, you know, I, I would say, again, the biggest do of any virtual interviews is be yourself and be comfortable. And yes, you're speaking into a screen, right? Like Brenda and I are talking to each other. We don't see anyone, but just be comfortable and, and you know, learn to make it as, um, as best as you can. Again, arrive early, be polite, look into the camera, be open-minded. Um, and it's okay to ask people what they love about working in an organization, right? What a better endorsement, um, you know, dress appropriately. My gosh, don't risk it. Uh, you know, always be professionally dressed for an interview. Um, you know, don't, don't wear something crazy that like if something goes wrong with the video uh, won't be, you know, won't be a great situation. You can have notes and information ready, but don't read a script. Um, there's nothing worse than somebody reading a script and it just feels so, you know, so fixed and so finite. And so know your stuff, know the aspects of yourself and your experience well enough that you don't have to sit and read a script. And um, I'm going to turn it to Brendan. Yeah, I think that authenticity comes through and uh, I think certainly the younger generations are more comfortable and apt with this kind of setting. We've all, I think, accelerated to that point. Um, but virtual interviews, I mean, you really can sort of have a cheat sheet over to the side. And I'll say, I mean, all levels of executives use them. Um, and that's just, you know, I, I think the main, one of the, the biggest tenets of interviews is really being able to couch your experience with specific examples. And um, jot a few of those down for the functional areas that you might expect might come up in an interview. Um, and just simple two to three little bullets of specific examples that you can cite. Because a lot of times, um, you know, people will be a little bit too high level with uh, how they address the question. So having those concrete examples of a time when um, is just really good to ha have a quick reference on. Um, and as advised, you just keep a shorthand list of those. Okay, great. So we, um, we have, um a couple of questions that have come up kind of related to resumes and maybe also some part of interview. Do you want to go through this slide and then we can ask those questions? I'm sure. And, and, I'm, and I'm watching the time. So we'll just, you know, the don'ts, don't show up unprepared. Don't be sloppy. Um, don't come with an attitude that you don't really care about the interview. Um, and, you know, this is so key. 
it's a two-way street. You're interviewing, they're interviewing you. So you are just as much trying to assess if an organization, if a team is right for you, just as much as they're trying to decide if you're right to join their team. So, so I'll pause there and we'll welcome any questions. Wonderful. Okay, so a question that we've gotten a couple um, ask on is, how would you recommend um, the question of salary? So it's often being asked, maybe you're asked to give a range. Um, some people have noted that LinkedIn kind of gives general ranges. What is your recommendation of gauging that to not you know, aim yourself too low, but then to also not overprice yourself outside of the market for that position? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And it's interesting because we're dealing at a whole other um, realm of salary. And it's almost, we don't talk about salaries during interviews. Um, we usually, you know, but we wouldn't, um, we wouldn't interview someone for a position if they were way out of the range. But when we present candidates to our clients, we're not talking about salary. We're more focused on experience and if this person's a great fit. Because in our experience, if somebody's amazing and the client really wants them, they're going to come up a little bit in the salary. But I think when it's like a more mid-level role, um, you, you do have to adhere to a range. Um, you know, it's, it's a tough question because you don't want to lose an opportunity because you're shooting too high. Um, and you don't, of course, you, you know, you do want to put a value to yourself, like what you can bring to the position. Um, so I would do my research. I would start looking on Glassdoor, what, what the role is paying at other organizations. And sometimes, you know, and I would probably use that as a guide. I would be researched when I come back and, and I'm asking for something based on what other organizations are paying for it. Okay, another question we get asked, um, related to putting your education on the top of your resume, if there was a gap between um, maybe doing an undergraduate going into the workforce and then pursuing a graduate degree later on in life, would you recommend putting those in the same spot or would you purely go in chronological order? So I think it, it depends on the career experience. So if you have, you know, five or more years um, working, I would put your professional experience first and your education at the bottom. If you're someone that's coming right out of school, um, I would put the education at the top. So I don't know if that helps, but if somebody has a gap, it probably means that they were working for a few years. So the work experience would probably come first. Perfect. So another question we got is any recommendations um, that you would give to try to get past the ATS um, within their resume, any keys with formatting keywords to try to help stand out in a potentially electronical situation? I, I, Brendan, what do you have? <laughs> we just don't face that often, so. I don't think so. So we can answer it. Yeah, you know, I would say, um, I understand those applicant tracking systems. I, you know, we see it day in, day out. I would put the keywords in because you don't want to not be called for an interview because of the keywords. Um, but what I would probably be doing, so I'd put those keywords in. If you want to stand out, I would be reaching out to the leaders, you know, the person you'd probably report into. I'd be reaching out to them on LinkedIn and send them a note and tell them you, you know, you submitted an application, you're very interested. Um, I would maybe reach out to HR as well and tell them, you, you know, on LinkedIn, you can send them an email if appropriate and just let them know, although you submitted your resume, um, you're more than the keywords, right? There's more that you can offer. I, I don't think that's too aggressive. I think it is a great way to stand out and to, you're not going to bypass those applicant tracking systems, but to make it a little bit more personal, um, sending those notes might help. Perfect. Um, another question we got is obviously due to the results of the pandemic, we have found that the current job hunt to be much more competitive than in the past. Do you have any advice on what job hunters can do in this pandemic climate that would be different from a regular job hunt? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab and then I'll, I'll let Brendan too. Um, I think it's, you know, it, it's interesting. We're, we're hearing a lot about how you differentiated yourself during the pandemic. And when we're hiring people at the CEO level, 
a key differentiator is, um, you know, empathy. It's that they've showed the ability, the learning agility, the ability to pivot. Um, they've they've thought outside the box. It's how they've treated their employees. It's how they've rallied the troops, right? Um, so when you're you're kind of flipping it and looking at people who might be beginner to mid level in their career. I think it's, you know, again, I think that empathy comes in. What have you done? Like, have you done any volunteer work? How have you invested in your community? We're seeing a lot with college enrollment. Um, they're, they're looking less at the IVs. They're looking less at the GPAs and they're focusing more on how have you made a positive impact in your community? You know, what kind of human being are you? And, and you know, what have you brought to the equation of how are you helping people in terms of who are struggling with the pandemic? So again, it's that personal edge. I, I think it's a big differentiator. And I think that it's it's more experiential and it's taking you out of the academics um, and investing you a little bit more in community and empathy. I think it reinforces kind of the creative outreaching um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a more competitive market where there's uh, more people looking, where there's more kind of volume everywhere. It really is reaching out to, as Jody said, sitting people at the, co at the company, um, alumni, and just kind of fact finding and network building to help either have somebody flag um, your interest come through or make other introductions. Because it's also a great reference point that you can have should you get an interview to say, I've also spoken with this SVP at the company, or I've spoken with this person, my alumni network that spent a few years at this company. Again, it's a differentiator. Um, and I think more than ever um, with, uh, as mentioned, with the volume in the market um, is really um, just being really creative with how else to um, get your name to the top of the pile. I have two questions related to cover letters. So I'm gonna kind of combine them just for sake of time. Um, so one person is asking, you know, what is the importance of a cover letter that they've done interviews before without having one? And somebody else asked a question that they were told that the resume should be clean and straightforward and just stating facts and the cover letter should be a way to tell one story. So what is mm -hmm. your thought on a cover letter, letter and then following that model? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to agree. Like the resume is um, really about your, what you've accomplished. Um, and it's metric and, you know, data driven. Um, and then the cover letter does tell the story and, and the cover letter is where you can really add in, you can tell why this job is the great job for me, you know, like why this is an opportunity that's right for me. Um, and it's where you get to show a little bit of who you are without all the facts and the metrics behind it. So I agree with that. Um, and I also want to touch on you know, um, and, and I think Brenton falls into this. There's been years at Corn Ferry where we're like, I don't want the cover letter. I just want the resume. And um, in the past year or two, I've really gone back to, I want the cover letter because a lot of people have amazing resumes and it's really hard to differentiate one amazing person with great qualifications from another. So I think of a cover letter as a writing sample and there's nothing more valuable. We have a few slides on communication and writing in, in particular. There's nothing more valuable than seeing how a person expresses themselves, about themselves. Um, so, you know, I think of it as a writing sample and, you know, how articulate a person can be in communicating why this job is the best, you know, why they're the best candidate. But it's also where you get to learn a little bit more of the softer aspect of a person and, you know, what they're going to bring to the role, what's the passion and, and you know, how they're going to articulate that. So I'll, I'll let Brendan jump in. Yeah, I think being mindful of the industry as well that you are applying to and interested in. I learned this in, in, in no better uh, setting than working with MBAs and working with hedge funds for five years. They, on the hedge fund side, they likely weren't reading two page cover letters. In our work now working in the education sector, um, it, it's a lifeblood of an application. And those are also the resumes that might be 15 pages long with, with academic publications. So it really, you know, both your tone, um, the succinctness of it, what to cover it is, is you want to be mindful of the, of the position and function and industry as well. Um, education, if you're applying to a marketing and communications position, obviously that, um, that cover letter wants to be indicative of that. Um, if you are more quantitatively or investment management or financial services, um, the cover letter is going to be a little bit different. So I think just knowing your audience, knowing who might read this, um, attention spans is really important as well. Um, and just kind of curating based on that. There's no one right answer for cover letters. It really is anticipating who the audience is going to be. 
Yeah, and, and you know, I'm going to just say on Brendan's comment, succinctness is key. Like we've got in some cover letters that are three or four pages for writing related positions and they are succinct. So, and it's necessary that they cover, you know, three or four pages. Um, but if you're not going for something in the arts, then one page at the most, and you, you know, don't, don't weigh people down with tons of information, give them what they need to know in a, in a very clear manner. So we do have some follow-up questions related to addressing gaps in a resume. Um, and I'm gonna kind of, kind of combine some of them together. So some people are saying that they may have gaps for personal reasons within life, but they may not really want to be able to highlight or share um, on a resume. Maybe don't have that volunteer experience to note, um, potentially maybe were furloughed, let go, anything of that nature. So I know you had mentioned you saw a resume that had like gardening noted. So for those that maybe don't wanna share quite as much on a personal aspect and maybe due to their situation, they were unable to volunteer, how would you recommend or any tips to help them stand out so that way they're not considered automatically as a no for a position um, just based off of their time away? Yeah, I mean, if you're not going to go, if you're not going to share it, then you just, I think, have to sometimes let the gap speak for themselves. But, you know, something to, to think through is you will be asked, right? So if they don't worry, you know, if, if an employer, potential employer sees it on a resume and still wants to interview with you, um, you have to be prepared for how you address it when you speak to them. Um, so I don't think there's anything wrong with being furloughed. Uh, you know, tons of employees were furloughed. Doesn't necessarily mean it had anything to do with performance. So I wouldn't shy away from, you don't have to put on your resume, but be you know, prepared to talk about that during an interview. Um, if it was something more personal, I think it's okay to say you had personal life issues um, that you had to address during that time. You know, you're going to have to deal with it in some way. So if you don't want to put it on your resume, I would just keep the years going, right? And, and so you can see the gap. Um, but again, you're probably going to have to talk about it in some capacity. And, and professional development means so many different things as well, whether that's a, a, a you know, a low time commitment credentialing program you're in, um, professional development as far as advancement towards another degree, an online class, that can take a lot of different shape. It doesn't have to be a full-time time commitment during your period of furlough or in between, but um, they are good points that I think would be resonant for, for employers, um, but to Jody's point as well, just, just have talking points around it, what it might be. Furlough, again, means a very different thing now than it did 12 months ago. It's a universal except we, most of our team went to furlough and are now back. So um, I think it's an understood, it's just how you position it. Are there any key questions or topics that you do not recommend being asked in an interview? Doesn't, oh, God. Um, well, no one, you know, so this is where that diversity equity aspect comes in a little bit. I mean, you should never be asked about your personal life. Um, you know, you should not be asked if you're married or single. Um, it, you know, you shouldn't be asked certain things. I, I don't even know, unless you have a story about like if you paid for school um, and work full time, like no one should ask you like who paid for your schooling. Um, no one should be talking about marriage. No one should be talking about, um, you know, th there's certain criteria that no one can ask you. It's just unethical. Um, and I think maybe the positive, the gauge is if you feel uncomfortable during an interview, you can say, I'm uncomfortable with that question. And you don't have to answer it. Like if people are really grilling into salary details, there's pay equity laws, depending upon where you live, you do not have to disclose your salary. We cannot even ask people their salary. We can ask them, what do they seek to earn? Um, so I would say salary, your relationship status, your financial status. Um, you know, if a company wants to do a background check, a criminal credit check, they can do that, but they, they really should not be asking you about that during an interview. So here's one question. Um, so do interviewees usually wear work attire for virtual interviews? The interviewees. Um, do that well they should well you know I'm prefacing it because we've sat on we sit on we sat on interviews last night Brendan and I and gosh the the interviewers and interviewees so the interviewee was always in formal attire the interviewers were not um 
I mean, I want, I would love to say it's a personal choice, but on a professional level, always be professional. Um, you know, know your audience again, but always be professional. Um, don't come to an interview you, just as much as you wouldn't want somebody interviewing you in a wrinkled, you know, t-shirt. Um, don't be that person. You know, it's an opportunity to put your best self forward. Uh, you might, even if you go to work every day in jeans and a t-shirt, um, I think an interview is an opportunity for you to come to, you know, bring your best self and hopefully your interviewers will do the same thing. I, th I think the same tenant as, as in person, it's, it's better to be over-prepared or over-dressed than under. Um, and I'll go back to just from uh, working in the MBA space, you know, it might be industry dependent as well. Um, if you're coming in from tech, if you're working for, if you're looking to work in a, in a large CPG or a retailer and you wear <laughs> a brand of someone else, obviously in faux pas in that sense. Um, but more traditional industries are always going to be more business formal. It's all, it all comes down to that first impression. But we owe, and, and Canada ask us all the time, but I think it's always better to caution on the side of um, overdoing it a little bit than, than underdoing it. So, and I think that it unchanged in, in the virtual setting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'll, I'll point out at least two or three clients have said to us very recently, wow, the candidate was so sloppy, I could not get over how sloppy they were. And um, so that's even like in a comfortable, you know, we told them they could be business casual. So it really counts. Like you really do need to bring your best self. Cool. So I'm gonna try to do a couple more and then we can get back to the slide. Um, hopefully this one should be a fairly quick one. Regarding education, is the graduation year important or just the, the degree institution itself? This is another, <laughs> these are great questions because they come up uh, like uh, constantly. Um, you know, I still put years in, like I haven't done a resume in quite some time, but I have no problem putting my years in. A lot of people don't and, and it's, you know, because age can be a form of discrimination. Um, but the reality of it is if you do move forward, they will, any organization's going to do a formal education verification and see the years you graduated anyway. So I think it's, um, if you just graduated in the last two years, I would say absolutely put it on because you want somebody to see that like you're newer to the workforce. Um, if it's been over 10 years and you want to leave it off, that's fine, but keep in mind, if you move forward with an opportunity, the employer is gonna have that information anyway. Okay, and then we have another one, um, making big career sh um, shifts to a new industry. How would you recommend reflecting that change on a resume or within LinkedIn in a positive manner? So that's my favorite thing. We love people who've been in great finance careers, um, who come and run a nonprofit organization. So career transitions, celebrate it, put it down there. You know, I think it also, what was, what was behind it? What was the motivation behind it? I think you can capture that in a cover letter. Um, I think that on a LinkedIn profile, you can, even in the summary section, you can say 10 years in X and then transition to Y because of, you know, why. Like I'm a career transitioner um, and, and I, I hope we can get, even if we skip some slides, I do want to get to that, um, the range aspect because that might give you some ideas, but I would just approach that head on. Um, I, it shows that you can be incredibly adaptable and if you can be successful in more than one career, that says a lot to the right employer. It's not as uncommon as you think. And, you know, a number of years ago, we, we saw more that people were within one industry vertical or function for, for entire careers or you know, 25 plus years. Now with the pivots, um, with the kind of bleed over into different industries, the complementary nature of a lot of different industries, the cross-functionalness of different industries and functions, um, it's more common. So I, 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 it's inherently evident that it's a switch. Um, and uh, as far as listing things, I it's just, a, it's a pure listing, but, um, you know, in conversation and in the cover letter, you can give more kind of rationale and philosophy behind why the switch. Okay. And one more knowledge guys get back. Um, so when it comes to sharing experiences, I'm going to combine two questions. Um, is there like a time limit? So if somebody has an achievement that might've been several years back, is there anything wrong with still highlighting that, even though it may have been so far in the past? And then with that, um, tips on how to list your most oppressive achievements. So do you list them first or do you go ahead and do it in chron chronological order on a resume? 
Yeah, so so he, so here's what I would say with the first one. Um, how if that achievement was 10 years ago, you, you have to have done something great since, right? So like, you don't want to reach back to like, nobody reaches back to high school and they were like a superstar athlete in high school if they haven't played sports, you know, 20 years into the future. And so I would be asking myself, how does that great achievement, how did it inform what I'm doing now? And if there's a tie-in, you know, if it's a few years ago, absolutely add it. Um, but if it's, if it's like 15 years ago, um, you have to ask yourself, like, because it, it raises the question, has this person not done anything great since then? And that's more of a red flag. So I would just think about how that achievement's informing now and, and help that to be um, a determination. And then I'd have to, you know, the, the, the second part, I think it depends because um, your resume should be chronological, but if you have an achievement that stands out, maybe that's something on a resume that you can put in that little summary section. You know, so it's like a teaser for somebody to see there's this great achievement. And then when they're going through the resume, they can actually see in chronological order when it occurred. Um, but, but, you know, again, it's a specific case. I might, that might be a conversation as opposed to just like generic information. Yeah, and I think natural, you know, awards or noteworthy certifications transition over time from a listing and chronologically um, displayed to just more of the narrative. And it's good to mention in um, a paragraph on um, cover letter or more just in conversation. So to Jody's point, it really is, um, you know, sort of dependent on, on the content area and the time from that period as well. Perfect. Well, I'm going to go ahead and let you guys continue moving forward. Um, and if we have time for additional questions, we'll certainly re come back to them. <laughs> Sure. So I'm going to skip a little ahead because we would like to get, you know, like these are great questions and, and, you know, if we can be useful, we'd love to get to them. So I'm just going to skip a little ahead. I don't know if it's possible, um, Katie or Matt, to share, you know, we can share this deck um, if anyone wants to look at it afterwards. Um, and, you know, we won't go too much into rejection, but I do think it's so important. So if you you know, read through the deck after, um, that could be helpful. And maybe we'll get to, you know, the landscape of careers, how much they're changing. Um, and, and maybe we, we start here, right, at this evolving landscape, because I just came upon this article in the Wall Street Journal in January that I thought was uh, really fascinating. And it talked about the career landscape um, from today through 2029. And um, we all know that, right, we all know that everything is changing and it's what jobs we have today might not exist in a few years, but the hot field, right, really surprised me. So I wanted to just put this out there and, um, you know, wind turbine technicians, nurse practitioners, solar installers. So it really looks like a lot of the focus 10 years into the future is on clean energy and on an aging workforce. So, um, you know, in the next eight years, uh, a huge portion, a quarter of the workforce is going to be over 55. And that means everything, you know, reading that article, it shared everything from we're going to need more pet sitters, right? Because an aging workforce is going to need people to look after their pets and they're going to need more healthcare workers. And we just lived through a pandemic or we're still living through it. So just something to think about, right? Like um, you probably are going to change careers more than once or twice in your lifetimes. And they're saying these are the ones um, you know, to be on the lookout for. Um, and I did also see a master's degree is going to be more of the norm by 2029. So if you are out there debating, should I go back for that degree? It's, you know, it, it looks like it's going to be required for a lot more entry-level positions than it is today. And so that's uh, really interesting to think about. Um, we wanted to make sure that you you got to see this and digest it, and you can absolutely look up the Wall Street Journal article and read a lot more about it. Um, okay, and one other thing, really important to talk about is soft skills, right? So we spend so much time learning technical skills, um, whatever industry you're in, and I can't stress enough the soft skills. Um, there was actually an article in the Wall Street Journal recently too that said, should we even be calling them soft skills anymore? Because this is really the crux of everyone's career. You know, critical thinking, creative thinking, um, analytical thinking, innovation, 
So this is just, this is it, right? And so um, you might want to start asking yourself, like, what, what experiences can I pull up on each one of these soft skills? Like, you know, it's, and, and I'm going to show you something really fascinating. Um, these are all skills you're learning in college because the overlap, it's 100% overlap. What you're learning in classrooms, whether you're virtual, in person, and what you need to know in your career, it's a, it's a strong overlap. So, so definitely, you know, think about this and think about like start reflecting a little bit about examples of, um, you know, how this relays and what you've done in, in college classrooms, graduate school classrooms, and how you're going to bring this to your career. You might be asked about this during interviews, right? So it's just something important to think about a little bit. Um, and, you know, it's interesting in a college classroom, I don't think professors often talk about skills. Um, so, you know, you're, you're talking about subject matter so much, but no one's stressing the skills. And so, you know, you probably have most of the skills you already need to go into, you know, a full-time position just from being in a college classroom environment. Okay. Um, the writing and communication, again, the facts are there, right? So, so really, really try to, if there's one thing you, you focus on improving upon, um, it's the writing and the communication. Because if you cannot tell a story, whether it's about yourself, whether it's about what you're doing day in, day out in a job, um, you're going to end up falling short. And you know, also 80% of corporations assess your writing skills. So if you haven't taken a writing test yet, chances are you're going to, even virtually, um, you're going to be doing it. And, and it, it's more the norm than not. Um, so, so try to focus on this, how you can become a better writer. You know, unfortunately, we write in shorthand so much now, whether, you know, we're interacting with our friends texting, but there is still an art to writing in full sentences and paragraphs. So, you know, as an English professor of plug um, and Brendan's English major as well, like, you know, something to keep in mind. Um, okay. And, and. I'm gonna keep moving on a little bit because we wanna to get to, maybe we stop with purpose and alignment. And, and Katie, maybe we also pause because I, I see the time ticking and you know we're glad to answer some questions as well right now, if that's helpful. No problem. Let me real quick go through and see what some of our newest ones that we've had. Okay, so another question related to resume is, how should sections of the resume be grouped? Um, example, experience altogether, then accomplishments and achievements, um, or should they be separated? Should they be intertwined? What, what thoughts do you have? Sure, um, so I would say um, for every position you have, I would think of it, what are the, your three accomplishments? So I would you know, go chronologically um, from the most recent position you're in to you know, then go to the past. Um, but for every role, instead of putting a job description down, I would I would look to put accomplishments down. And anything you'd add to that, Brendan? Yeah, I think that <clears throat> always keeping um, in mind how to frame those accomplishments. Um, typically, I mean, at the base level, one of the things that always stuck with me was my work X yielded Y, or my team's X yielded this result. Um, and really quantifying, no matter what the industry, no matter what the position, uh, that shows progression, that shows action orientation. Because um, again, it can you can you can be in the weeds with with buzzwords. You can be in the weed with weeds with trying to align to a specific job description that you're applying to. Um, but really, like an X yields Y always stuck out for me, and I think can be applied to any any model. Hey, any advice for an older but still energetic and capable job seeker? Go for it. I mean, there, I, old doesn't exist. Um, gosh, uh, you know, if we, we're not supposed to talk in numbers, but there's people in their 70s who are still leading organizations as CEOs and incredibly successful. And so I would not let age um, set you back at all. I would think about what you bring to the role. And, you know, sometimes experience is key. Some, some roles ask for 25 years of experience. Some ask for five. Um, but I would always be thinking about what you bring to a role, right? Because different stages of your career, you're going to bring different skills and, and attributes with you. We have, we have um, two board members for different boards that, that uh, we've done searches with in the last year. 
um, both board members are in their actual 90s and we're more put together and on top of it than some of the other people half their age on the board. Still go to work every day, um, can even navigate Zoom interviews. So um, there's no there's no ceiling anymore. One was the chair of the board actually as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, I, I mean, everything is changing. People are living longer. So people are working longer. So I, I wouldn't let that worry you at all. So what should someone do if their past experience does not have any relation to the current job that they're applying for? Um, should they just include whatever experience that they have had so far on their resume? Or should it be, if they're able to, more detailed to the position that they're striving to get? Yeah, so I guess my first question would be is um, what's leading them to go for a job that they have, you know, like has nothing relevant to their background. And so I think that's a great opportunity for cover letter um, to fill that gap of why this job, why now, and why things in their backgrounds are leading them to this opportunity. You know, what skills, the skills are transferable. Um, some experience is transferable. So I would be focused on What's that transferable experience? What are the transferable skills? And then that, that you know, here it is, the passion and, and mission. You know, what's the alignment? Why, why this role now? But, you know, you can't change your experience, right? You can adapt it a little bit more for role. But what you've already accomplished is, is pretty stable. You can't change that. Yeah, you, you have to create that bridge. You have to create that narrative. And while it might seem on paper a left turn or... Um, you know, more of a disparate gap between where you've been and where you're going. Um, the lines are blurred today, and it really is about the functional experience. I mean, we talked to 20-year defense attorneys that now want to be an executive director for a mission-oriented nonprofit. Um, so it's really just about, while it might seem on paper like there's a gap um, or a spread, then um, it's about, again, as Jody mentioned, what, what is your motivation? You have to be able to craft that story. I think we kind of covered this, but just in case we did get another question, um, should a merit scholarship be listed on a resume? And I'll kind of add um, how maybe that might change depending on how far out someone is from that time of education. I would add it, you, you know, it, it's interesting. I see on resumes all the time, people 30 years into their career talk about, um, they got a merit scholarship or they talk about finance themselves through graduate school um, while, you know, they, they work full time and went to graduate school full time. And it could be 20 years ago, 30 years ago. I think you put that because that shows, you know, it's a work ethic and it shows that you achieve something. So, you know, you, but you have to put it in the right place on your resume. You might put it under awards and community work and, you know, something towards the bottom, but I would absolutely include that. So we have someone that said that they are a software developer and they're thinking of getting into an executive position, for example, a tech director or even a CTO level. Resume wise, what changes would you recommend that they make and any other steps that they might want to explore taking? Yeah, so I guess the question is, um, are they ready for that role, right? Like, is it, is it like, do they have the experience? Like, so we, we work on CTO positions all the time. And so, you know, do, if they meet all those qualifications then their resume should speak for itself. Um, so maybe, you know, in a cover letter, I'd be writing why you're ready for this stage in your career, because you could also be a CTO at a small organization, which requires different experience than one at a much larger, you know, global public company. They're going to look for a very different skill set. Um, so that might, you know, we might, that might be a specific conversation to understand if the person's ready for the transition and, you know, and them having that confidence that their background has prepared them to move into that next level. So we do have a question um, related to individuals that are looking um, at positions that might be in a different country. So they have the um, outstanding academic achievements and, but they're having issues getting interviews and calls from a company in a different country. Any recommendations or suggestions related to that topic? Yeah, so, um, so some, some NGOs we work with say flat out on a job description that they will sponsor students. And so like, I, you know, I don't know the details behind it. Like, does this student, does this person seek um, sponsorship? What does that look like? Are they an expatriate and trying to move back? And so, you know, there's, there's a few unknowns there, but I, I would go to a company website and see 
who does sponsor, right? Who does want people? There's plenty of organizations. We work with World Bank, we work with IFC. So to them, it doesn't matter where somebody, you know, they can be in London, they can be in, in France, like it doesn't matter. They just look for great employees. So some organizations are not sponsoring anyone from other countries right now. Um, so, so I think it really depends, but I think it's doing a little bit of research um, to make sure the company is in the position to sponsor someone from another country. Perfect. So another question related to potentially looking at a position in a different country. Um, you did kind of know, obviously, here in the States, every kind of state has their own, um, you know, legal legalities of what they can and cannot ask or share. So the question is, is that if they are considering relocating, they're doing their research to try to learn a little bit more about the policies. Should they discuss that topic in the interview or should they postpone it for further stages um, if they are to advance in that qualification? Yeah, so um, it's hard to say because at, like, I, like I'm, we're only referring to US laws um, and every state has different pay equity laws. So I would assume most countries have different laws. Like in other countries, it's the norm to put your picture on a resume. In the U.S., it is not. Um, and it can be used as a discriminatory. Um, so we don't want to see pictures on resumes. So, I mean, like some of these are just so nuanced, um, depending on a country. I would say, you know, I, we as a whole don't talk about salaries um, during interviews, but you do have to get that information. And so whether there's an HR person who can help you with that information, you know, you want to cover that. I would only talk about salary if you're down to your finalist for an opportunity, um, you know, but it really depends. Like in the US, we don't usually talk about salaries during interviews that's handled separately. Um, in other countries, I'm not positive. So we have two questions related to um, more than likely being a student, maybe having some volunteer or some internship experience, um, but you know, jobs are looking for two plus years and they don't, um, internships and volunteer experience don't count. So the two part question is, as a fresh graduate, would you recommend still including any clubs and activities, um, even at the high school or university level on a resume? And then for those that maybe don't quite have the two plus years of full work time, how would you recommend them trying to leverage their internship or volunteer experience on a cover letter to try to help sell themselves? Yeah, I would just use it. Um, you know, I would just talk about it because an internship is job experience and volunteer work is still job experience. Even if an organization doesn't count it, it is. And, you know, everybody has to, you have to start somewhere to get experience. And so most employers understand that. Um, I would list it on a resume as job experience. I would list it in a cover letter and talk about like, what skills did you learn? Um, you know, what did you gain from those experiences and how did they empower you for this opportunity that you're ready to take on this opportunity? Um, so, and you know, something else, just uh, some advice to offer is if you can't get an internship and, you know, and, and it's hard to get that experience right now, you, sometimes there are shadowing opportunities and shadowing is, where you're just like spending a few weeks with somebody living, you know, their life with them at work, you're helping them. Um, and it's, it's really like an apprentice type of opportunity. And I've seen a lot of organizations be open to that shadowing opportunity, gives you great experience um, and, and insights into a specific industry or role. And, and as an intern as well, if, if, you, if it is a six month period, and I think the question is if you don't have the two years, you know, if there's specific project work that you that you did um, that you followed up with after after the internship, a lot of times there are um, unpaid opportunities to continue on through the fall semester or spring semester. Um, and then to the point about clubs as well, you know, I think if they're professional clubs, um, not necessarily the um, social clubs, but again, if you're in financial services and you did an investing or a pitch club, absolutely, because there's a direct correlation to, to the industry or even translatable experience. But I would stick to more of the academic or professional clubs, if any. Um, I know in the MBA space, um, those are the livelihood of full-time MBA students, so absolutely. But there's also a lot of social clubs that are not applicable or interesting um, or appropriate for um position descriptions or jobs that you might be applying to. So, you know, use best judgment, but I'd say if there's something um, actionable work that you did, project association or professional clubs. Oh, 
well, another question we did get is related to joining a board. Um, so this person noted that they've enjoyed unpaid service on local boards and would like to expand on that experience. So any recommendations on exploring and being able to identify potential board positions um, somebody might be interested to apply for? Yeah, so we, we work, gosh, we work with boards every day and we work on board roles. And um, volunteer boards are wonderful, right? And, and different levels of them have what we call a give get. So you, you're actually like, you're paying, you know, you're making donations. I would say, you know, board opportunities are not always posted. Some of them are, I mean, we work on board opportunities. We don't typically post them, but we're looking for people. Like we go through LinkedIn, we do research. So I would look at the board you wanna join. And, you know, I would treat it like you're, you're researching for your career. And I would look at what are the, you know, whether it's five to 10 organizations, um, whether they're regional or national that you'd like to be a part of because board terms expire. And so I would do my homework, I'd figure out which boards I wanna join. And then I'd write to the board chair, the, the current board chair and say, here's what I'm interested in joining. Um, here's you know, my fit and, and here's what I bring to the equation and so forth. And you know, when those, those terms expire, maybe they'll come back to you, but there's no like magic to it. Usually you get tapped by a board to join them, but I think being proactive could be helpful. It's a lot of similarities with the job search. It's networking, it's your own outreach, it's proactivity, um, and it's identifying you know, the how and why it's interesting for you and what you could bring most importantly. Okay, another good question did come through that I think might apply to several people on this. Um, so if they, someone worked in the executive position before, you know, how does it look applying for a manager, manager position? How do employers see that if a person is wanting to actually take a step back from a job title that they had previously? We need to understand why. Um, what's motivating it? Is it, um, is it because of, you know, purpose? Is it because um, you just want to make a career change? Because no one willingly um, takes a title cut and you know a pay cut unless it really makes sense, unless it's something that they're passionate about. Um, you know, if it's a career shift. So I think it really depends. Um, that's when your career story you really have to shine it and make sure you're you're on target um, to explain because on a resume it doesn't always look right. When you go from an executive director to a manager, you're going to get asked a lot of questions about it. So I would be thinking about what's motivating that, what's behind it. Um, and, and make that part of your career story, make that part of your cover letter. Perfect. That seems to be the majority of the questions that we do have. If anybody does have any additional questions, um, would you like them to message us directly and we can get that over to you? Absolutely. And, you know, we, we will absolutely be glad to share this PowerPoint. And, and I would point out there's there's a few slides on what recruiting and hiring managers seek. That if you look at anything, I would absolutely look at that because it talks about what we're seeing today in the market. Um, and Brendan, and not that I'm speaking for Brendan, but we are absolutely glad to answer any questions. You know, uh, find us on social media. You can link in with us, and if we can help you and uh, add any additional information, insights, we are glad to. Wonderful. Well, if anybody is unable to locate either Jody or Brendan on LinkedIn, you can reach out to our team directly at bgshonors at beta gamma sigma .org, and our team will be happy to share your questions on your behalf. Well, at this point, if we have no other questions, um, Jody and Brendan, thank you so much for hopping on and just having this wonderful session. Thank you for those that have participated. We hope that you've walked away with some great information. Uh, thank you guys again. We look forward to hopefully having you guys on a future webinar series. Jody and Brendan, thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks so thank much. Thanks. Bye.